welcome to this podcast of the Florida Historical Society. I'm Holly Baker, podcast producer for the University of Central Florida's History Department. Today's podcast features an interview with historian Dr. Erin Conlon from Indiana University in Pennsylvania about her article in the spring 2018 issue of the Florida Historical Quarterly titled, Work or Be Deported, Florida Growers and the Emergence of a Non-Citizen Agricultural Workforce. Have a listen to our conversation. You uh, wrote the article uh, for the spring 2018 Florida Historical Quarterly titled, Work or Be Deported, Florida Growers and the Emergence of a Non-Citizen Agricultural Workforce. Um, In it, you explained how private agricultural employers in Florida developed uh, the modern farm labor system. And I wonder if you could tell me more about that. You know, I think part of it is is having people recognize that industrial agriculture is prevalent throughout the United States, um, that my work was really looking specifically at Florida, but a lot of the trends that you see are actually happening in different places around the country. You know, more people are probably familiar with the Bracero program um, as opposed to the Bahamian or BWI, the British West Indian program, as it became known as. Um, And so a lot of these trends you're going to see in other places. I think Florida becomes a unique place to look at that, particularly because you start to see the emergence of an East Coast migration stream um, that really emerges during this period you had mentioned, looking from sort of the late 1800s through the 1900s. And so if we kind of frame it in that way, we can start to look back and say, okay, well, what was going on? Um, Some of this relates to circular migration that had happened in the Bahamas from essentially the very beginning, right? If you go back to look at Bahamian history and a lot of the Caribbean island nations, people were constantly engaged in seasonal migrations just because it was a response to living conditions, the environment looking for opportunities. Um, And so really around the 1890s, as you had mentioned, that's where you see this first influx of Bahamians that are coming to Florida. And that's because Florida is starting to develop. You know, there's more people starting to settle there. Um, but you can go back even to earlier histories. I know a lot of other scholars have have looked at moments around the American Revolution when you had loyalists fleeing from the Americas going to the Bahamas and bringing their enslaved populations and then realizing that's not going to work and you know trying to figure out what to do next. And so we've always had this back and forth. But really in the 1890s, you see large numbers of Bahamians migrating to Florida and they are engaged in sponging and turtling and other types of industries, mainly down in the Florida Keys towards Miami, Homestead, that area. Um, And then as Florida starts to gain some traction, you start to see more individuals who are coming for the railroad construction, um, agriculture when it emerges, and tourism. So if we kind of keep that in mind, and we can come back to that again if you'd like later to talk about that, Um, but you start to see early on in Florida that there's a reliance on either Bahamian labor, or at the time they just would have referred to it as black labor, right? That it would have been, whether it was African American, or if it had Bahamian roots, maybe some other groups that were mixed in. Um, But there was this long history there that was reliant on black labor, and that had done most of the heavy lifting for agriculture, tourism, construction, all of those industries. Um, That was pretty common throughout most of the South at that point in time. And in Florida, then, you start to see some changes that's happening in terms of this transition of a labor force. Um, And that's really around sort of the Great Migration period. Uh, You know, during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl area, we see a lot of migration in the United States in general. Florida follows that trend. Um, But we see a massive uptick around World War I and World War II, where you have the Great Migration. You've got millions of African Americans that are really trying to look for better opportunities. Um, Not everybody left the South, right? A lot of people went from the rural South to an urban South looking for opportunities in cities. Um, But a lot of people also did leave the South and they headed up North. And one of the driving conversations that I found in my research that in a lot of ways is never fully answered is whether or not there were actual labor shortages or perceived labor shortages. And in the end, it frankly doesn't really matter because they were able to utilize either the real labor shortage or the fear of the labor shortage to still get the outcome that they wanted, which was a pool of cheap, exploitable labor. Because with the Great Migration, they were starting to lose that, they being agricultural employers. And so as you had agriculture kind of developing, they're looking to see, okay, how do we maintain um, an exploitable pool of labor that's going to generally work a very difficult job for very low wages? Um, And the reason that they're doing that is because agriculture tends to have thin margins in terms of profits to start with, and Americans like to have cheap food. Um, You know, I was just recently looking at some studies. There was a 2015 Vox article um, that had come out and was talking about how Americans spend the least on their food of anybody in the world, right? We spend about 6.5% of our household budgets on food that we eat in our homes, goes up to 11% if you count restaurants. 
Um, but based on their calculations, right, they're showing that Americans are very used to having inexpensive food, and that comes at a cost to somebody, and labor is often where that is. Obviously, technologies help with that as well. Industrial agriculture is great for mass producing food and keeping it affordable, um, but there are some trade-offs in terms of labor. And that was something that Florida had come to rely on pretty quickly, was having low low wages so that they were able to kind of build up those profit margins. So when they're kind of getting into the, the Great Migration period and you've got a lot of African Americans that are leaving or at least pursuing other job opportunities, there starts to be this real fear that there's not going to be enough workers. And so during World War I, growers had started pushing to bring in Bahamian workers. It never panned out. Um, you know, they sort of had these informal migrations that were happening, but there was no formal system in place. But by the time they get to World War II then, and there seems to be even a greater demand because more and more workers have left the state, they sort of dust off those old plans, right? And you have the same players. That's where it's really fun looking in the archive because you see the actors are all the same, or sometimes it might be the children of, the, of those people, but the family names are still there. And so you see them kind of dusting off these plans and saying, look, we've got this desire to bring in foreign labor. They have a desire to come because many of them needed the work. And so it becomes kind of this mutually beneficial to an extent uh, relationship. And so Florida starts to then really embrace this foreign labor system. So during World War II, we see that uh, the government's very actively involved in that, right? That's where they form the Bahamian British West Indian program, and they are actively importing workers and they're helping to facilitate that. It starts in 1943. Uh, the government's actively involved in recruiting, transporting, doing all of the, the things that a labor recruiter would normally do, the government is doing. By the time the war comes to an end, they still have these emergency measures in place. 1947 is finally the end of that formal government to government interaction. But what the government, US government says is we can continue this program because growers say it's necessary, but we're gonna step away. And so private grower um, associations stepped into that void and they were working with the government then to be able to coordinate bringing workers in. And that's the program that's gonna continue up until 1966. In the Bracero program, it ends in 1964. And again, that's uh, sort of a different beast out West. It's a huge program. Um, the level of abuse that has been associated with it is widely studied and widely talked about. Um, I think you see a little bit less in terms of what was happening along the East Coast because the numbers were significantly smaller. Um, you know, whereas you have almost a half million workers at various points in time out West in Florida and the United States along the East Coast, the numbers are in just the tens of thousands. So it's much smaller. Um, so by 1966, you start to see the, the formal program coming to a close. Um, and we can talk about kind of, there's a bunch of different reasons that contribute to that. And so we can talk about what's changing in the Bahamas, what's changing in the United States. Uh, and then as part of that, right, you also have this changing kind of labor trend and mechanization that's happening starting in the 1950s. So if we kind of pull out and look from kind of a broader perspective in the United States, you see some of the agricultural areas out West that have started to embrace new technologies, uh, which is means there's gonna be fewer workers, so more people are being displaced. Um, there's also changes in immigration policy and attitudes during the 1950s. We see an uptick in anti-immigrant attitudes, things like the 1952 um, McCarran-Walter Act, which reinforced the quota system that had been implemented earlier. And as part of that, they create this H-2 provision, which allows for the modern H-2A program to emerge. So there's sort of these overlapping histories as to which programs are happening, what are some of the new rules they're being adopted under, and then how are attitudes changing? And so if we go from seeing this trend in the 1950s that's happening, what we start to see is that many um, people who identified of some sort of Latin descent, oftentimes Mexican or Mexican-American, were moving out of the Southwest and looking for new opportunities, whether that was over places that were going to be kind of less anti-Mexican or you know, anti-immigrant, um, but also looking for familiar types of work that they knew how to do. And so they started gravitating to Florida. The numbers are pretty small in 1950s in Florida. 1960s, they start to increase a little bit, but it's actually really not until the 1980s and 1990s that we see a massive change. Uh, the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act is gonna have a huge, huge impact, as does NAFTA. And with those demographic changes then, 
what we see are these overlapping histories. We see this, you know, progressive kind of um, change over time for African Americans leaving agriculture in larger numbers. We see Bahamians who filled that void. When the Bahamians are moving out, it's the same times that more uh, Latinx workers are coming in and they're starting to fill those same needs. And then all of a sudden it becomes clear to a lot of employers that it's actually less desirable to have these formal guest worker programs and it's it's more affordable for them and you know it's better for them as an employer to be able to take advantage of undocumented workers or falsely documented um, and that's a term that we'll be using kind of probably throughout the conversation is talking about people who are either completely undocumented or who are using false papers to be able to work but still these are people who are are working very much on the margins and existing in the margins of society because they don't have access to the full legal system since they're not here as legal workers one of the major things that we see and becomes, I think, really fascinating in a terrible sort of way about Florida history is that when you get to World War II and Florida growers are saying, we need to have guest workers. We need people to come in and do this work because we've got a labor shortage. And the government says, OK, we've got a lot of Mexican workers coming in. Right. And all of a sudden, Florida is like, mm -mm, no, no, we do not want to have Mexican workers coming in. And the government's like, but you said you had labor shortages. Right. And they're like, but, but that's not going to work for us. And so the government was like, OK, well, you know, why not? And they're saying, well, they're Spanish speakers and we're, we're English speakers, so we're not going to be able to communicate as effectively. They're really far away. So we don't know that that's going to work. And so the government's kind of pondering this and is like, OK, well, Puerto Rico. And so this is a part where you see in the, the historical record, right, until in the 1960s, 70s, you could even argue today that people were very overt about their racism. And as a historian, that can be really helpful because you're not trying to guess at what somebody's saying, you're actually just reading what they're saying. And so there's this exchange that happens around Puerto Ricans, and it's in this broader context of the Bracero program as well. And Florida growers say, no, we do not want to have Puerto Rican workers coming in. And the government's saying, but this is going to be super helpful. These are U.S. citizens. We know that Puerto Rico is looking to have workers try to you know, find jobs. We're going to be able to bring them in. They're going to meet your labor needs. And you see them explicitly writing the growers in these letters and saying, no, this is not going to work. Again, they speak Spanish. That's not going to work for us. Uh, the other problem is that we don't know how to classify them, right? That they see themselves as being white. We do not see them as being white, but they don't see themselves as being black. But we don't know where to put them then because we have a segregated society. We have white housing and we have black housing and we don't know what to do with brown people. Right. And it's, it's completely written out as sort of saying like racially, we don't know what to do with this group of people. And the other really telling component is they say the other problem is as U.S. citizens, if they don't like the work, they can leave. And so now all of a sudden you have this complete ownership of saying we want a non-white workforce that clearly can be categorized as being black and therefore we can all assume treated in a particular manner in the state of Florida, right? So there's this assumption around race. And the other part clearly becomes around citizenship that as a citizen worker, you have the right to leave your job and nothing's gonna happen to you. Whereas if you are a foreign contract worker coming in and you leave your job, you're going to get deported because you are violating your contract and now all of a sudden you are not here legally anymore, right? You've absconded and that's why people suddenly just disappear is because they know that if they just refuse to work, they're often going to be deported. And so you start to see when you talk about the emergence of the modern system that you know, the intentions often are going to be, I think, on the part of growers to keep costs down. And that's totally understandable, right? In the system that we have in a capitalist economy, you can see the need to keep labor costs low or to keep your production costs low. But the problem that we see being layered into this from the history is that a lot of the decisions that were made were looking to say, well, who can we exploit and take advantage of in order to keep those labor costs low? And when you do put it into that context, then all of a sudden you start to see some of the trends that we still see today are reinforcing many of those same problems. Um, you know, an element that I, I didn't really get into as much in the article, but I think is really important, and you see this in a couple other scholars' work as well, is the idea of an invisible labor force. Um, historically, farm workers and a lot of the people who had done the labor in Florida, and this goes back to the days of slavery, right, those are invisible workers. They exist behind the scenes. They live in a different area. It's often sort of hidden from the main roads, the main houses, and modern 
farm work is the same way, that typically people are tucked away into very rural areas. And so they're not on a consumer's radar. When we go to the grocery store, we're not really thinking about who is producing or picking the food that I am now taking off a grocery store shelf. And so that layer of invisibility can be really detrimental to workers because so much of what they do happens way beyond the purview of the general public. In your article, you talked about Operation Wetback, um, the U.S. government's attempt to reduce illegal immigrants in the country in 1954. Uh, so uh, just wondered if you could tell me about Operation Wetback. Um, a lot of the research that I did for this part came from Kitty Calavita's work inside the state, which is an excellent source if people want to find out more about it, um, because she really is looking to see how immigration and naturalization services, which, you know, was the name back then, today you'd have ICE, your Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, how they were trying to address border issues. And when you go back to the 1950s, they realized that the border is quite porous and they're not going to prevent people from coming in. And so but if you take a step back, even before Operation Wetback, one of the policies that she talks about is that essentially it's called this touchback program, where INS officials would partner with the local employers, agricultural employers, employers usually, and they would look to say, okay, well, when do you need workers, right? And the employers would say, we've got certain harvest seasons coming up, or we've got planting seasons, this is a labor intensive time, we need workers. And so INS would basically say, okay, well, let us know when that's done, and then we'll come round up everybody and deport them. But there was this conversation that was sort of like, okay, we'll let you do your work, and then we will get rid of the population once we know that's done. In some cases, the touchback element of it was where employers needed more workers still than the, what they could get on the Bracero program. And so what they would do is they would work with INS who would then be walking in and saying, okay, we've got this group of individuals who are here and they're undocumented. We will have them touch back over the border and then we will reprocess them as Bracero workers coming in. So now they're legal workers. So it becomes this interesting system because what we start to see is uh, migration patterns that emerge, right? That it's, it's not surprising that if you are an individual and looking to say, okay, I've got family members who have participated in this program, they go to the same farms every year, they've done this for a few years, well, I'm just gonna go there too and see if I could get a job. And so we started to see with some of these programs then that it's actually going to foster an increase in illegal migration of people who couldn't get into the program, but are still looking for that work opportunity. What it does then is it creates challenges for employers, right? Employers need to make decisions around what is going to be most cost effective and what are the ethics of it. So in 1954, if you're kind of looking at that moment, you have in, in 1952 was that McCarran-Walter Act, which I had mentioned before, which reinforced immigration quotas. So it's a further restrictive immigration policy. U.S. immigration policy uh, becomes a really key part of this narrative, and I think it's one that's often overlooked, right? We often like to say in the United States that we're a nation of immigrants. That is true, but we are a nation of very selective immigrants for most of our history, right? If you kind of look to see when people say, well, my, my ancestors came in legally, it would depend on when they came in. Prior to, you know, 19... 17, when you have the real first Immigration Act being passed, coming in just meant showing up and not being visibly sick, right? Like that was pretty much it. And with 1917, we begin the period of restrictive immigration. And as the name suggests, right, you're trying to limit who's coming in. And that grows increasingly more restrictive as time goes along. Um, the most detrimental, right, is in 1924, and again, reinforced in 1952, where you have the quota system. Uh, and in 19... 24, when they set that up, they set the quota based on the census from 1890, right, which took it back to a period that was predominantly white, northern and western European. There were some weird exceptions for people like Mexicans. Um, they crossed over back and forth between being white and non-white at various points in time, depending on the demand for labor. And that's where you start to see some of these policies that, that clearly are not sure how to deal with groups of people. So if we kind of think about that, in 1952, they reinforced that national origins part. There's definitely concerns about America, American identity, um, having larger number of immigrants coming in. What is that going to mean for the populace? And so at that point, you have an, an effort by INS to, to conduct Operation Wetback. Uh, the name was, was speaking derogatorily towards people who had crossed the Rio Grande, right? The idea of being a wetback, like you've traveled through the river to it, and that they were going to go in and um, deport all of the people who they could who had crossed illegally. 
So employers um, were pretty supportive of this in terms of trying to say, well, if, if everybody is banned from using undocument, undocumented workers because they're now not available, that actually benefits all of us because now it levels the playing field. The problem though, as you can guess, is that it doesn't actually happen that way. So people who are planning to can try and use the Bracero program, which it existed, are now competing against people who are still trying to use undocumented workers. And so then there becomes that issue over costs. And suddenly that person can pay even less money because it's completely unregulated as opposed to the Bracero program, um, much like the British West Indian one, which has a floor that's put in place to try to make sure workers are getting paid at least a bare minimum. One of the major arguments for guest worker programs that we see in favor of them, right, is that it helps home countries by being able to send workers in to earn a living and to be able to make more money than they would at home. And that is certainly true, you know, at least in looking at the Bracero program and the BWI program, there were a lot of people who were able to earn money and go back home and start businesses, buy or build homes, um, to continue on with life, to leave money for their children, to have a bit of a legacy. As we can guess, the question is, what's the trade-off for that? Um, and that's one that we are still certainly grappling with today. And I think when you asked about sort of how does this affect our understanding of immigration, there's a couple of parts to that. So one of them is saying, you know, how do we make sure that, that farm workers, whether they are domestic or they are immigrant workers, are coming in and being paid a fair living wage, right? That it's not this floor that's been set uh, because the floor means that in a guest worker program, you offered the job to Americans and you couldn't find enough of them. Well, in general, the reason people don't take a job is because the wages are too low or the working conditions are too bad. And so by setting that, it kind of shows us, well, if you have to go and get other workers from different countries to do this, there's probably a good chance that those wages and working conditions are not very desirable. And so the systems themselves are really problematic. And that's something that historians have long talked about and worried about is that when we embrace the idea of guest worker programs is that to an extent, we are making ourselves comfortable with exploiting somebody else whose home situation is even worse, right? And yes, it's great to come in and earn money, but again, making sure that we're not taking advantage of what does that mean? Right? Uh, are they able to unionize? Are they able to push for better wages if they find that they're, they're not getting paid enough or that their conditions are not what they thought they were supposed to be or that they are not as healthy and safe as they should be? Or are those people just gonna get deported? Uh, because historically, they tend to just get deported. Uh, you don't have any instances really of guest workers being able to unionize because they don't have the same types of protections that domestic workers had. Granted, most agricultural workers do not have union protections uh, until much more recently, and even, even now it's still very difficult to unionize. What is the state of agricultural labor in Florida and in America today, um, you know, as compared with how, how it once was? Yeah, I think, so obviously we are in a, a very bizarre period right now, um, you know, for the listening audience, we're recording this during the coronavirus, right? So we have this global pandemic, which creates a whole different layer of challenges for everybody. Um, if you, people have been following the news, they're familiar that, you know, farm workers are essential workers. In order to get food on to grocery store shelves, you have to have people doing that labor. Um, but many of the challenges that they're facing are similar to I would say almost any of the groups that we have of essential workers who are concerned about their, their job conditions. For farm workers quite often, and this I think is, is a national issue, not just a Florida issue, um, but it's a red crowd to transportation to and from sites. You know, whether it's larger groups of family or friends that are, you know, piling in together into a personal vehicle and traveling, or if it's one that's a bus or something that's provided by the grower, um, that usually there's not going to be enough space to keep six feet apart and socially distance. Uh, the same thing if you're working out and you're harvesting using certain machinery, you may not have the ability to be six feet away from somebody. Um, I do think there's the benefit of being in an outdoor environment, which so far seems to be a bit safer than being trapped, you know, inside of a closed kind of store, um, but that doesn't necessarily negate those, those issues. We also tend to find for a lot, of, a lot of farm working families that they tend to live in more crowded housing arrangements. Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily unique to farm workers. That tends to be more of an issue for working class families throughout the United States, right? They don't have the luxury of being able to spread out if you don't have an apartment big enough for everybody to kind of maintain that social distance, especially when they've been out working. 
So I think the the issues around that are are you know prevalent amongst many working class families right now. For a lot of the farm working community, um, it's estimated right now nationally that there's about two to three million farm workers. And again, that's an estimate because we don't have exact numbers. And largely that's because it's estimated that half of those workers are undocumented or falsely documented. So it means that a significant portion of that working population is also gonna be ineligible for federal and state benefit programs, depending on where they live. Um, so things like paid sick leave. So if a worker is sick, they may not have the luxury of being able to stay home and still collect any sort of income. Um, and so it increases risk exposure for everyone. Also, as we know, people are asymptomatic carriers, right? So that creates another challenge that you may not know and still be engaged with other people. And then just basic access to healthcare. That is one of the biggest issues for farm workers um, of all backgrounds. And again, for almost any low income American is making sure that they have access to sufficient healthcare. For farm workers in particular, that is hugely problematic because some of the other subsequent issues that we see for farm workers are around pesticide exposure. So that's been one of the major issues that a lot of um, organizations have been kind of focused on over the last several years is thinking about pesticide exposure and what does that look like? What are the health impacts not only for workers, but for their families and communities, um, for their children, you know, for women who are pregnant and out in the fields working, obviously that can have some serious repercussions as well. And so there's definitely issues around kind of the exposure levels. Um, and I think, you know, for a lot of Americans, this is a, a difficult issue because we know that a lot of people are concerned about pesticides on their foods as well, but that when you get into organic farming, it tends to be much more expensive. And so again, it brings us back to thinking about the cost of food um, and thinking about, well, what does that mean not only for you as a consumer when you're looking at produce, but also what does it mean for the person who was, who was harvesting that? Um, so in terms of, you know, some of the, the contemporary issues, I think there's some that are unique to the pandemic that we're in now, but I think a lot of the traditional issues have remained the same, whether it's around the pesticides and safe working conditions, um, wages are still certainly an issue, you know, you'll hear studies where they'll say, well, farm workers can make up to, you know, $13 an hour right now or $15 an hour. And that's true, but the problem is, again, depending on where you are, and specifically in Florida, is that's often seasonal work. You can't harvest crops in Florida year round the way you can in certain other places, you know, say for California, for example. Um, the year round elements of agriculture are much more complicated. And so when you're in Florida and you don't necessarily have that full access to year round work and you're limited to more seasonal, it raises a host of issues, right? Like what is your actual income over the course of the year, not just during the harvest season? So we have farm workers that tend to live in significant poverty. Um, and then with that, right, are associated the challenges of linguistic barriers if people are uh, not native English speakers or if they're not even native Spanish speakers, right? That you have a lot of individuals who are coming from countries, um, say Guatemala or Mexico, where they speak other indigenous languages. And now they're landing in an area where when these problems arise, they may not have the linguistic skills or support in their community to be able to articulate them and to make sure that their concerns are being addressed. So there's issues certainly around the wages and the working conditions and just the physically demanding elements of the work. Uh, you know, if we think about the dignity of associated with doing work and working hard every day, that is very much an American value. And farm workers embody that, right? They go out and they, they are doing this backbreaking work. It's often referred to as stoop labor because you spend all day bent over, uh, you know, hunched over, picking things off the ground. And it's very difficult. And so there's also a point at which your body physically can't do that anymore. Uh, but again, because not all, all of the workers have been able to accrue enough wealth or qualify for programs like Social Security, um, which they often pay into. I think one of the, the side notes here is that for falsely documented workers, you know, we, we don't want to get into arguing the ethics of it, but if you have falsely documented workers, they're paying into the system, but they're never going to be able to withdraw funds from the system. And so when they do go into retirement, it becomes a challenge for family members to help to support elderly relatives who just physically can no longer do that type of work. And so it becomes difficult, right, to see those economic gains at a large scale throughout the community because there's a variety of challenges that people are facing. And I would argue most of those challenges that we see today are the same ones that we would look at over the last 50 or the last 100 years. When I was doing, writing my thesis, uh, I came across Bell Glade, you know, mm -hmm. um, and the workers there, those that were Bahamian workers. I was just curious if you um, had to do any research or did you learn anything about that community? 
Yeah. So when I had first moved to Florida, I was living in Naples. And Naples is about an hour from Immokalee, Florida, which is in central Florida. And most people in Naples will never have a reason to go to Immokalee. You know, your sports team might play against them, but otherwise most of the people in the community are not heading into inland Florida. And I remembered I had just moved there and I found an article and it was in National Geographic talking about modern day slavery cases, right? And I'm thinking like, oh, modern day slavery around the world. And then I get to the paragraph that's talking about Immokalee, Florida. And I just had this moment of, oh my goodness, right? Like this is quite literally in my community's backyard. And so for me, that was really this eye-opening moment where I thought, this is something I'm interested in. Like, I would like to understand more about this. And it was largely because when you, at least, you know, in the, the early 2000s, when you heard instances of modern day slavery, it almost always was around sex work. And while that is certainly a major issue and something that needs to be addressed, I was really surprised to think about it in terms of food and agriculture. And obviously we know it's now an issue with seafood and many other industries as well. Um, and so it kind of got me thinking into this about like, how does our, where does our food come from? Who's doing the work of that? Because again, it's something that's invisible to most of us. You know, we might have our, our little plot in the back, you know, where you're producing a few things for summer, but we're not, not, most of us are not providing enough food to sustain ourselves over the course of the year. So we're all dependent on these food systems. So Immokalee in the modern day slave cases had been sort of my, my entrance point into this. And then from that, I had worked with my dissertation advisor, Joseph Spillane, who was amazing, right? And we had started thinking about how, like, what's going on with agriculture? What's going on with labor? What are the elements of race that are happening as, as part of this history? And so one of the things that I had started looking at then was some of these early periods of development in Florida. And speaking of Belle Glade in particular, um, so right around Lake Okeechobee is where most of the early agriculture is happening. Um, if people are familiar with that area, you're talking about towards the Everglades, there is what they call the muck soil, you know, just where something is mucky, it's dark, it's, you know, it seemingly is rich and people are like, we're going to make this stuff grow. Turns out it's actually not that easy. Uh, there are a lot of issues. They decide to do sugar there first. Turns out to be a disaster for most of them. Most of the sugar companies are going to go broke. Um, but eventually they start draining off portions of the lakes in the areas and they realize with the right kind of combination of fertilizers that they're able to grow. Uh, crops in these soils. It also turns out the soil is terrible to work in. Workers would talk about getting home and where it just felt like they were getting bitten by flies all over their body and there were no flies, but it was the soil irritating their skin and it's tiny and it's porous. Um, you know, it would, when the wind kicked up, it would get up into your nose and it would burn your eyes and it just, it was everywhere. It was in your hair, it was under your fingernails, it was in your, your clothing. So it just constantly was rubbing and just these really terrible working conditions there. And so many of the workers, and these would have been you know, especially if you go back into early history, as I mentioned, they were going to say black workers. They didn't differentiate between African American or Bahamian workers. Um, and for a lot of the workers, there's no record of where they came from, right? Because farmers would hire people to come in to work for the day, the week, the month, and it would just have a name. There was, there was no additional information with it. Well, my attention was first drawn to Belle Glade because you have these horrific hurricanes that rip through Florida. And yeah, in 1928, you have this massive hurricane that rips through Florida. Um, it passes through West Palm Beach where it causes some damage, but then it just decimates Okeechobee and Belle Glade. Um, in, in a lot of ways, it's kind of reminiscent of what we saw with Hurricane Katrina, where you have the levees are breached, right, as the storm is stalling out over this lake. It just doesn't have the infrastructure in place to keep that much water back. And all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's cresting over, it's breaking through, and Belle Glade and other communities are absolutely decimated as a result of it. Um, there was an estimated, again, we don't have the exact figures, but probably 2,500 people who died as a result of that storm. And the vast majority of those were black workers. We don't know anything else about them in terms of you know, where they were coming from. We do know some of them would have had Bahamian connections because a lot of the families in the area did have connections to the Bahamas. Um, again, in the early 1920s, 30s, you have more of that kind of circular migration that's happening. So, um, so some of them would have come from the Bahamas. Many were African-American. And we partly don't have any record of that because after the storm passes, basically the communities went through and they gathered up all of the white bodies and they put them in caskets and they buried those in plots and then they took all of the black bodies and dumped them often in unmarked graves. And so there's again no record in life and there's no record in death of who people were. Um, and so you have these communities then that have sort of suffered this long 
history of neglect and oversight. Um, there was an excellent book, and I'll have to look up the author for it because I don't remember offhand, uh, that talks specifically about the hurricane and, you know, makes the point, had this storm decimated West Palm Beach, we would all know the name of it. I wouldn't forget what year it happened, right? We'd all know kind of what had happened and that it was this major tragedy that it took down this beautiful touristy shopping area of Florida. But instead it happens over this impoverished, predominantly black community of farm workers. And there's virtually no history of that, right? That there's just not much said about it. Um, again, it's only been recently that it's kind of worked its way into people's consciousness as they were starting to do some construction projects and stumbling across these mass grave sites and realizing, okay, we probably need to figure out where people are buried and, you know, if there's any way we can uncover a little bit of this history. Is there anything you'd like to add before our interview concludes? I always like to ask that, just in case I forgot to touch on something you wanted to mention. Yeah, you know, I've thought a lot about how to approach this topic. And it's one that I, I just feel very conflicted with because it's like, you know, I'd love to have some tidy answer at the end that's like, and now this is what we should do to avoid these problems, right? And, and I don't know. And it's, I don't think there's any good that comes from vilifying employers or agricultural, you know, producers because they're trying to operate in a capitalist system that, you know, recognizes there are tight profit margins and you cut costs where you can. And so trying to think about how to do that ethically. And I think there are some really great farmers out there that are doing that. I think some of it is a product of a system where we're trying to figure out how do we deal with wanting inexpensive food that industrial agriculture produces, but also, you know, responsible and respectful. Um, you know, and I guess for mine at the end, it's thinking of, you know, how do we try to acknowledge the workers who do this work that we are all very reliant upon and try to make sure that, you know, when we're making our own consumer decisions or, you know, when we hear in the news and there's talk about, you know, what a, a new guest worker program might look like, that we pause to think about, okay, what are the, the different elements at play here, right? And that I, I understand there's no easy solution because we all do have different interests. Um, but I certainly would, like us to think about who are the workers that are doing this work, even if we don't see them in our own communities, but to know that we do rely very much on the work that they do. Um, you know, Cindy Hahamovich is an excellent scholar who's written in this area, and one of her books is called The Fruits of Their Labor, and it was that book that got me interested in writing my own dissertation. And I often think about that phrase, right, the fruits of their labor, and that we are consuming the fruits of people's labor. And that oftentimes you had asked about sort of contemporary issues is that for a lot of farm workers, they can't actually afford to purchase the fruits of their own labor, right? That there is often quite a gap between, you know, what, what something costs and what people are able to afford. Um, and I would hope that we can move towards a point where, where people are more visible, that there is a respect for the work that they do, um, you know, and that we can take a step back from fighting over whether or not a worker is illegal or illegal, and instead thinking a little bit more about sort of the basic human rights that we want workers in the country to have. Well, you're amazing, and I thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It was really enjoyable. That was Dr. Erin Conlin from Indiana University in Pennsylvania, talking about her article in the spring 2018 issue of the Florida Historical Quarterly, titled, Work or Be Deported, Florida Growers and the Emergence of a Non-Citizen Agricultural Workforce. Thank you for joining our international audience for this podcast. The Florida Historical Quarterly is the peer-reviewed scholarly journal of the Florida Historical Society. The Society was founded in 1856 and is the only statewide historical organization in Florida. The Society is headquartered in Cocoa, Florida, and the editorial offices of the journal are in the Department of History at the University of Central Florida. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and that you'll consider supporting future scholarship on Florida history by becoming a member of the Florida Historical Society. Thank you again for listening.